lack promoters is that IPTG is freely diffusible. We'd have the same problem with lack promoters, and in fact, they did many 40 years ago when they discovered this effect. Um, but we, when we're building pathways, we often use three promoters, um, FOI, or two or three different promoters, and we use two or three different induction systems to try to balance those pathways and find out what's limiting. And often, you know, we run into these toxicity issues, and so having a well-controlled pathway is, uh, or, or promoter is really important. So for us, it was another tool in, in the toolkit. And, and that really brings up the next question, and that is, um, it's taken you all this time to get this far and with this many people. Uh, how long is it going to take for the next product? And I think this is uh, my plug for uh, spending time developing tools and making those tools open source because uh, we haven't patented any of those tools. All of those are freely available. You can write to me and I'll send them to you. They're all in the publications listed there. Um, so we've spent a lot of time putting tools together um, that will work together um, and not have adverse interactions. And hopefully that will make the next product and the next one and the next one even faster. Um, certainly with respect to terpene products, natural products, we're a long way up for the next one, right? We're, we're six orders of magnitude. There was a question up there. Uh, hi. Um, I don't know how you, you give our, um, artemisinin to, to people, but um, you work in E. coli, right? And E. coli is uh, not a generally recognized as safe organism, right? So, I mean, how do you do it? Why don't you use um, PCAP stories or anything that would be safe for people? Um, well, we're, we, we weren't thinking of E. coli as a delivery mechanism. Um, this product would either be distilled out of the culture medium or extracted in some way, solid phase extraction. Um, so um, e. Coli, e. coli, well, you could go through a, a CGMP process uh, and, and use E. coli just like they use it for some therapeutic proteins. Um, and, and also then you have the added feature that you can use heat and distill it, your final product. Um, we used E. coli because I know a fair amount about E. coli, a fair amount more than I know about any other organism. And when we started out, there weren't that many tools available for metabolic engineering or synthetic biology. And the tools that were available were mainly in E. coli. And you know, I think it's still the case that E. coli is very well known. And we wouldn't be this far in terms of the engineering if we had to spend time on the biology. Another question there. Um, I was struck by Roger's question, 10 postdoctoral years to get you towards this kind of drug for malaria sounds to me absolutely inexpensive and cheap. <laughs> so I wondered what the what he was talking about. <laughs> um, it was it was so the tool development and putting artemisinin and pathways together was was far more than ten postdoctoral years of work. But yes, you're right. So everything else that's going into you're right. It's cheap, and um, in fact, uh, what we're going to find. Um, in the next five years is that the world is going to spend anywhere between one and five billion dollars a year buying artemisinin. And there's not the supply out there. So the cost is going to go up. And in fact, both GSK and Novartis have contacted us and want something in the pipeline right away. It's not going to happen. But <laughs> Other questions? J Jay, uh, uh, two questions. How do you uh, plan to get the next two orders of magnitude, and why is uh, prostatin uh, not cause cancer? Um, let me answer the second question first, and that is I don't know. <laughs> um, not because I, it isn't known, because I don't know. Um, the, the first question is we've got two orders of magnitude to go, and of course it gets the, the more production you get, the harder it gets to get the next increase. Um, but if you look at what we've done, we haven't really monkeyed it around at all with the chromosome. So we've got all of these central metabolic genes to mess with. Uh, we still have acetate being secreted. Uh, we still have a number of organic acids being secreted. Um, I don't know if you know Lonnie Ingram's work where 
Uh, he uh, mutated a number of pathways in E. coli and produced acetates and succinate and organic acids. Well, imagine now that you stop at acetyl-CoA and don't produce acetate, and now you funnel that through uh, that mevalinate pathway. There's another really interesting aspect. It turns out HMG-CoA, which is an intermediate in the mevalinate pathway, is toxic to E. coli when it accumulates. And who would have known? I mean, it's never been in E. coli before. Um, so now we have to balance this pathway. So the minute we start producing, pushing more flux through the pathway, the better balance the pathway has to be, which is interesting from an engineering point of view and fun from an engineering point of view. But I think it points to the fact that uh, I don't think two orders of magnitude are going to be that tough. We'll take uh, two more questions, one there and one there. Hi. Um, I was just wondering what the, the biosynthetic sequence from amorphodine to artemisin is. Is that known? or? Yeah. Uh, I didn't talk about what's left uh, to be done. We've got to get a couple of P450s out. Um, there's at least one P450. We need to get to artemisinic acid, and from there we can use some chemistry and, and make the final product. Um, so we need, and that's in fact what we're doing right now. We're trying to pull out the remaining steps of the pathway. Unfortunately, um, to date there's been no money to do this work from you know, for anybody else to do it. I'm not a plant guy, but I'm doing it. Yeah, I, I, the cost that Roger might have, whoops, the, the, that Roger might have been referring to is that the, it's an opportunity cost, right? That there's so much to do, and there's no roadmap yet in the sense that the semiconductor industry has had a roadmap. So clearly, the the the, the better we get at developing tools and and design design tools and guidelines in addition to the actual materials, the, f the faster we'll be able to move, so. Exactly, exactly. Okay, let's thank our speaker. <laughs> and we'll, we'll have a 15 minute break and we convene at four for an exciting risk discussion. <laughs> so the format for the next, um, hour and 50 minutes, uh, we're going to spend about the next hour discussing uh, risk related to the development of new technologies and specific as it related to synthetic biology. I'm, I'm particularly grateful that George Post from the Biodesign Institute at Arizona, Arizona State University was able to join us today. Uh, George is going to talk for about half an hour. Uh, then Roger Brent from Molecular Sciences and Brad Smith from the Center for Biosecurity at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center will come up and we'll have a, a, a response and discussion to George's remarks, after which we'll open it up for a, a, a conferee-wide discussion. Immediately after that, uh, Professor Paul Rabinow from the Department of Anthropology at, at UC Berkeley will come up and give us his uh, context for considering uh, how we might best proceed as a group. So thanks very much, George. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, although the word synthetic biology is on the first line of the title, this is as much a talk about the generic frameworks by which society attempts to look at the uh, oversight and regulation of anything it really doesn't understand. Uh, and in short, uh, we have a whole retinue of vanguard technologies that society appears to be increasingly fearful of as the overall risk-benefit equation shifts as society becomes increasingly cocooned from risk. So clearly, the activities that uh, I can't do justice to in terms of the elegance of what we've heard uh, at this symposium uh, one zero, and I trust that we will have two or 1.1 1 .1, uh, next year, it is this, namely the enunciation of the rules of biological design moving from its most reductionist uh, to higher order principle. And although I've listed physiology, clearly perturbation of higher order systems in terms of the genesis of pathology uh, is equally important. Put another way, mapping the rule sets and understanding what is the plasticity embedded in biological systems and how do complex systems display the type of adaptive capabilities they do, and at what point does adaptive plasticity, judged within the broad domain of normalcy, uh, overlap within the framework of pathological perturbation? 
and the constellation of knowledge that will be generated from this over the coming decades will drive us increasingly towards robust frameworks for predictive biology and with that, of course, synthetic biology colloquially captured here as exploring biospace. This whole issue of universality in the utilization of essentially chemical modular units to build combinatorial assemblies of devastating uh, uh, sophistication and extraordinary diversity means that we have only yet touched probably a sliver of that combinatorial space in evolutionary time and therefore that issue of exploring biospace. So leading then to some of the sort of issues which again have been touched on, but given the fact that this field in is, is in its most embryonic form, it is as you look at it with its perceived myriad benefits, but also for those who look at the risk side of the equation, these are the sorts of general applications that society will begin to see the field of synthetic biology uh, engage in but it is undoubtedly that last bullet of some of the more extravagant dimensions of exploration that will probably trigger this. But it is, at the same time, a paradigm of contemporary science at large, namely intellectual convergence between hitherto largely disparate disciplines, namely the life sciences, material sciences, and miniaturization engineering, the ubiquitous reach of computing into all aspects of the research enterprise, but building increasingly towards brain-machine interfaces and linked to that, even though clearly uh, uh, brain biology and all its manifestations fits clearly into biotech and systems biology, the intrinsic complexity of that organ and all of its implications uh, probably deserve a separate position on a Venn diagram. But in short, exploring biospace and where that may lead to augmenting human performance is probably the flashpoint because if one is going to define the domain in which ethical, legal and social implications will begin to be identified and debated in this field, it is across a broad array listed in those four columns. But in terms of registry with the public psyche and the political psyche, which is where we really have to be concerned, it is undoubtedly that box on the, uh, on the far right in terms of uh, the likelihood of this being potentially not only used to modify humans, and then all of those have overlap into this category of dual use, namely the utilize the opportunity to utilize information for both beneficent and malevol malevolent purposes simultaneously. And of course, all of this is part of a much broader debate, which is very easy to conduct in the esoteric cocoon of the affluence of Western democratic societies. And that is the fact that are we engaged in seeking, harnessing our intellectual creativity to find problem, to solve problems of daunting complexity, or alternatively, are we en route to a technological dystopia, as some would argue. So that's the sort of root cause here. And bio biotechnology has much greater resonance with the public psyche than other dimensions of the scientific endeavor. You talk to people about the superconducting super collider, their eyes glaze over because it's so abstract. The fact that someone may be trying to produce a proton bomb uh, is irrelevant because it doesn't register. The uh, overall issue is the fact that bio registers with people irrespective of their social, cultural, or economic background because health matters to people. And it is in that framework that synthetic biology will have its registry far outside of the halls of those engaged in this as a scientific endeavor. And going down to the fourth bullet, it is the one that's always played up, that this is sort of science out of control, our hubris and our arrogance, and then linking that into the broader domain of sort of a... Uh, genetic robotics, as it were, that, uh, that all free will is absent and that we are merely the latest Mark V version of the brain wiring diagram of higher center function and all of the fears that are attendant uh, with that. But undoubtedly, the other lurking fear is this issue of unintended consequences, which by definition is difficult uh, to define. And as people feel more and more alienated from the direction and vector of modern science, that's why we see irrationality beginning to invade uh, on so many levels, not just in terms of theocratic fundamentalism as a catalyst in relation to terrorism, but the broader issue of how people in Western 
democratic societies feel alienated from science. And then you have the big one uh, of uh, whether you use post-genomic, post-human, transhuman, in short, enhancement and eugenics, and then linking that to the carbon-silicon union, the cyborgian debate, and Greg Stock's term of the Fiborg, the functionally modified form in which we're all there. I cannot live without this device. Most of you cannot live with the other electronic appendages open at this moment, so we're already well on our way to being functionally modified. <laughs> so if you then look, if you were to attempt, and I believe we, and it's a point I'm going to end with, it is us, we must engage to chart this framework of rational policy, otherwise someone will do it to us. That is really the fundamental issue here. What are then the frameworks that one should look at? Namely, what is a measured assessment of risk and evaluation, particularly in the face of substantial ambiguity and uncertainty? What are the evidentiary standards that we should reasonably expect to be imposed before any constraint is even suggested? What level of public participation, or to use Philip Kitchener's term from Columbia, the vulgar mob, uh, are allowed to uh, actually influence the direction here? We may decide one thing here, but how do you then orchestrate that at the international level? And most importantly, in fields which are so dynamic, how do you engineer in the intrinsic adaptive flexibility that's needed to accommodate uh, change? And equally important, not just anonymity, who is accountable, not just amongst the regulated, but also the regulators, and how do you optimize incentives and the reciprocal of, of penalties to deal with that? What's the current status today? Regulatory systems embrace both the rational and the irrational. But most importantly, I think this is the bullet I'd like to emphasize on this slide, regulators and politicians are increasingly paralyzed by the pace of change in no small measure because of the widespread illiteracy at any level of Technology 101 amongst politicians in any of the Western governments and the 25-year-old staffers primarily educated in political science who will then make judgments about advanced technology. That is essentially the root cause of this. And at the same time, political populism, and I won't be hypocritical if I was running for the Senate, I would be equally guilty, and that is the fact that Certainly the one great myth which has been propagated in contemporary politics is the fact that zero risk is attainable. It has not only created the destructive distortions of tort law as we now see it, but it is propagated continually as a myth, and we as scientists and technologists do little uh, to mitigate that absurdity. And we have seen very sophisticated anti-technology lobbies that play on public fear, so whether it be genetically modified plants, Dolly and all derivative lineages from in terms of the cloning debate, and I cannot wait for Michael Crichton's uh, film uh, version of Prey to hit the streets shortly, and then anyone who uses the word nano in their lexicon will be judged to be a, be a, be a pariah who is about to undermine the complete metabolic fabric of life on Earth. <laughs> so what do we have? We have lack of any transparent rationale for how and why society modulates risk. Take those things that we don't essentially regulate in any stringent way. You may be prevented from driving while drunk, but for the most part, your ability to imbibe, your ability to smoke. In the Western democracies now, certainly in Europe, smoking and alcohol account for roughly 25% of the occupancy of all hospital beds at any given time whether in terms of acute events or chronic sequelae. At the same time, you can buy ginkgo or any mongoose dung or anything else that you wish to imbibe into your body as a herbal or nutritional supplement, while at the same time we impose daunting hurdles for uh, drugs and take them off the market as soon as even the most minimal element of risk is manifest. The public, for understandable reasons, tends to focus on extreme catastrophic risks, and in that, their entire perception of risk-benefit gets altered, and clearly what are called tombstone policies, namely policies that you can get through in the wake of some emotional disaster, and to some extent the Patriot Act is an example of that, even if not regulating technology per se, namely regulation which is passed in the face of a, uh, a framework of emotional response for something to be done uh, and a knee-jerk response. 
and at the same time, a sinister remark, in my opinion, uh, from Robert Reich, the year of big government is over, but law is at hand to save us all. Bill Joy, of course, in his infamous paper in Wired, where we are being propelled into the new century with no plan, no control, no breaks. And so, this leads us to, I would submit, six principles that shape the evolution of policies for risk regulation. The first is the paradoxical principle. People expect technical innovation and creativity to be harnessed quickly and to roll off the production line with the same regularity as Chevrolet's, but to be devoid entirely of any risk. And therefore, that distrust of science is paradoxical relative to their dependence upon it and their demand ever for its products. The polarizing principle in which basically activists and media sensationalism always overplay the risk but never offer any balanced perspective of benefit with risk. PC and political populism exert their insidious effects and the question of someone appearing with a different color label on their lapel from Hollywood is likely to be more influential than anyone in this audience in charting public opinion with regard to the absence or presence of risk. And the Europeans have essentially eliminated completely their competitive future in modern technology by the embrace of the precautionary principle uh, moving forward. And the past the buck principle needs no explanation. <laughs> Activism is real. It is sophisticated. It is powerful. It is well funded. And they know what they are doing. And they have a simple message to sell. It is much more difficult for all of us to talk about complexity. You know when you sit on a TV show that you're in trouble when the final question comes to you and they say, Dr. Brent, then you can't say there's no risk. And that's always the fast curveball to the head that's going to be thrown at you and how are you going to answer that one. Strange bedfellows. The NGOs, organized labor, and religious lobbies do in fact create a strange coalition, but they come together more and more. But I come back to us, ladies and gentlemen, we have been inadequate in countering these pressures, and unless we begin to confront them, we will in fact have only ourselves to blame. And then, again, coming back to the unique resonance in the bio world, the question of science and technology in bio-based industries in pharmaceuticals and biotech uh, perceived as being greedy, and the role of genetics in propagating corporate globalism. On the other hand, there is always the appeal to the fact that it is counter to nature or counter to some theological principle, and I think J.B.S. Haldane summed it up very well there, and Jim Watson with inevitable style put it even more graphically in the Financial Times. I don't even have to uh, read it, but it is, uh, it's one of the more direct quotes. Uh, but I think if you actually look at this too, it is a framework in which you have essentially uh, uh, an inverse sigmoidal curve. You go to some rapid peak of perceived fear, public panic, potentially with legislation and regulation, and then it all dissipates. And it is avoiding regulation at the, at the acme of that first curve that we need to be concerned with, because as is pointed out in the New York Times here, this eventually goes away because you're all still working away, not in any profoundly irresponsible way, and again, it all becomes attenuated. But it does come down again to this in the court of public opinion, what is judged to be natural. Throughout history, and, I don't, uh, and I'm not just talking about the post-enlightenment period, every single element of technological advance, as Haldane said, has been claimed to be inappropriate and offensive either to someone's theocratic principles or to the order, established order of society. You can literally take over five centuries and insert different words into the same headline. So you start in 1624, Dimotiu Cordis with William Harvey, when in fact showed that the heart, a beautiful piece of elegant physiology, that the heart was merely a pump. And of course he got a double first. He was excommunicated by the Pope, and the King of England threatened to execute him because the heart was deemed to be the seat of the soul. Then you fast forward another century and you have the degeneration of society with a J after Dr. Jenner, the introduction of vaccination. But of course, we're not in any way that philistinic today. No, just go look at the headlines in 1956 for the first kidney transplant, shock horror. The next heart trans first heart transplant, shock horror. Louise Brown, 1968, the first test tube baby, contrary to nature, shock horror, Dolly. 
and so it goes on. You could literally take the same headline and insert whichever particular technology you want, and it's when, when and where you want to insert synthetic biology into that uh, headline. So what is natural? There is this sort of view, particularly propagated by those in the humanities, that we have this sort of, there are not only the era of romanticism, neo-luddism and the Russian view of the noble savage uh, is set against this contrast where we have all spent our lives, will continue to spend our lives, and it has been the most vital force for human progression. But it will come under siege, rational inquiry coming under siege. Negative perceptions about technology continue to uh, proliferate, and probably, I'm saddened to say it, we will probably need some major catastrophe in order to savagely readjust society's perception of risk-benefit. I'm saddened to say that. There is also a quite legitimate concern over the equity of the applications of benefits. Are we essentially en route to creating our own gated community here in the affluent G8 nations of the West while the rest of the world is destined to pursue some sort of Blade Runner type uh, life outside of the boundaries? And I have to say that a remarkably neo-Luddite document published by the Presidential Council on Ethics, The Endangered Human, I apologize, it should have a capital E and H, the volume Beyond, uh, Beyond Therapy literally rejects anything uh, that you have discussed at this meeting as a vehicle for exploration. So set against that type of framework, how do you begin to even try and chart rational frameworks? These are the sorts of questions, quite legitimate, we as members of society expect regulators to ask. How safe is safe enough? What's the risk? Who's going to bear it? Is it equitably distributed? How are we going to deal with the intrinsic ambiguity and uncertainty that surround a field as dynamic and as embryonic? Uh, as this one. What are going to be the trade-offs if we, if, we, if we advance this but don't advance this? Curtail this or curtail that? What are going to be uh, the trade-offs? And if someone takes a voluntary risk, if I want to run across a freeway, uh, is that a risk which I'm accepting in voluntary fashion versus, in fact, should I, in fact, be incarcerated in an asylum uh, for even wanting to contemplate behavior of that type? In short, voluntary behavior versus imposed risk, and how will these much more ethereal dimensions of distributive justice and equity be addressed? These are the four parameters that scholars of this area typically define and fully appropriately, but again, we've seen that regulators are not consistent in their application of these principles, but it is those four criteria, effectiveness, efficiency, legitimacy, and the most difficult of all, social acceptance. And this issue of what is the level of public participation, yes, it may make us all feel warm and fuzzy and politically correct to say that we have engaged the public in the debate, but if you look retrospectively at where the public has been in any formative way engaged in the debate, you have regulatory imprecision, but most importantly, you predispose to over-regulation, you predispose to caution, and pub the public has an unrealistic expectation. We come back to it. Zero risk. But most importantly, the debate isn't with the public. The debate is with the regulators and the activist groups. And note, there's one group missing, you. That's a key omission. And it generates new sources of conflict. And at the same time, I think this is about navigation rather than control. So if we sat down today over a few beers and tried to chart what should be a rational framework for synthetic biology and even in, even it's in its most embryonic format, the greatest danger would be to attempt to set some prescribed boundary. And that's what regulators like because of the clarity. What we've got to do is to try and shape an adaptive framework. The words are easily stated. The practical translation is that much more difficult. And I've talked about accountability and international harmonization. And then this troubling issue of dual use knowledge. And interestingly, you speak to many people in the life sciences, they don't even know what you're talking about. The people in physics, engineering, uh, and computing have long come to understand this issue of dual use knowledge, namely knowledge which can be used simultaneously for beneficent and malevolent purposes. Historically, biology has been remote from this pro process, but as we shift from what I colloquially call the big bang, big metal weaponry of the previous century to where the life sciences will become increasingly engaged 
read the National Academy report on non-lethal weapons. It is a treatise on the application of biotechnology to an entire new genre of weaponry. Whether or not that is a legitimate vector is a matter of individual and societal opinion, but it is an engagement of the life sciences actively in that. Uh, I chair a major bioterrorism task force for the Department of Defense, and my characterization of the bioterrorism threat today, at least against humans, agriculture is different, but is I would characterize the bioterrorism threat as low probability relative to other potential modes of terrorist assault, but high consequence by definition. Will that be true a decade from now? Will the ubiquity of methods that you're talking about here today and are being replicated in every campus, not only just in the Western social democracies, but elsewhere, will that in fact be the reality? And the bio threat will become much more than infectious microorganisms. It will be that the enunciation of biological circuitry, the key regulatory nodes in every critical physiological process will become vulnerable for modulation. In short, sixth generation chemical weapons directed against particularly transcriptional processes uh, are already the sorts of things that people are beginning to stop and have to think about. And then you have this your own field of synthetic biology and synthetic genomics. And what are the distinctions in terms of knowledge management between these two different categories? Well known to you. The civilian applications are, of course, the public good. That is the framework in which information is put into the public uh, domain, and the intent is distributive equity and the application of free market principles. By contrast, military applications have an entirely different, not only motive, but the method and constraint on the dissemination of the information is entirely different. And every piece of information has to be interrogated against that. In the wake of 9-11 and the Amerithrax uh, episode in October of 01, the president of the American Society for Microbiologists made, I think, a very appropriate comment with regard to the fact that, yes, we can all see that it's well. We know what we're doing. We're responsible. Duh. The public doesn't believe us, and that is a very real risk, and the legislators don't believe us. I mean, I had a very senior and sophisticated senator say to me, George, why is it the physicists feel they can be regulated, but biologists feel they can't? Question to take on board, ladies and gentlemen. And it is not merely the neo luddism of, of the current U.S. Bioethics Committee. This is a statement from the Bioethics Commission when President Shapiro from Princeton was in its chair. And this is at the core of the matter. And I have no easy answers. None of us have any easy answers to this. But it is going to increase in its intensity with which people working in the life sciences will have to answer this question. So what is going to become constrained knowledge? Where is that going to be set? There are three categories of knowledge that I would ask you to take on board. The first is forbidden knowledge. The second is public knowledge. And the third is constrained knowledge. Forbidden knowledge is the easiest to define, namely, thou shalt not investigate this subject. That was only the preserve of certain medieval popes and some in the stem cell debate. Public knowledge is at the other pole, namely, you can investigate it, you can do what you like with that information. Where we are all going to have difficulty is this last category of constrained knowledge. That's not constraint in terms of the conduct of investigation. It is constraint in the dissemination of the product of that investigation. Namely, is the free and open and unfettered uh, distribution of that information? And there are five ways in which that can be dealt with. It can either be classified in the way that much other work in other disciplines has been classified. Namely, it never enters the public domain, but it's at least a clear distinction. The next category has been proposed, sensitive but classified, uh, but not classified. I personally think that's meaningless. Classified has a clear binary distinction whether you agree with it or not. But this is a term which is so flexible and semantically vague uh, that it really is not helpful to even insert it. Then, of course, we already have forms of data which are constrained in terms of commercial data and trade secrets or paying fees to access to data. But I'd like to end by also recognizing that we have got to begin to think about our own codes of conduct. Because science isn't neutral, 
and I think we have an obligation to think about what we do because we do posture even if we don't like it. We all write on the bottom paragraph of our grant applications, new insights into this mechanism will give rise to new drugs, diagnostics and vaccines, and for the most part, not give a shit about producing any of them. That is the ugly reality, and we constantly pay to public fear uh, in order to uh, grab money from the public purse. And in our more stark moments, we will probably accept that that is a far more ubiquitous motive than we would in fact perhaps like to concede. Codes of practice have always been with us. Francis Bacon, one could argue who was the first true experimentalist in the New Atlantis, was the first to introduce the word constrained knowledge. We've clearly seen it in the ancient guilds. That was almost the equivalent of trade secrets, which appeared later. We applaud ourselves for Asilomar, uh, rightly. In the robotics arena, we've seen clearly codes of conduct propagated, and we've also seen putative codes of conduct uh, propagated for the nanotech world. What are the shortcomings that we have to convince others that if we're going to self-police that we can deal with? There is the omnipresent factor of surprise. That's why we do science and technology. That's part of its appeal. But nonetheless, for society, that can be very unsettling. At the same time, we cannot. It isn't just the fact that, Dr. Post, can you say there's no risk? I can't even define, many of you can't, well, all of us can't define what certain vectors will be. I mean, you know, the fact that someone's saying something's impossible is likely to be interrupted by some idiot who's just done it. I mean, that, you know, that's, that's the world in which we're living in today, which makes it so exciting. But risk denial is also equally myopic. Just as we may criticize the public for their intellectual philistinism and the illiteracy of legislatures, we are arrogantly dismissive on far too many occasions to deny that there might any be any legitimate risk for public concern. And at the same time, there's lack of oversight in, in any form for this, at least as a straw man. I would like to put up a grid which I think is at least a helpful evaluative framework, and that is the fact that if there is a perceived threat, what is the scale of that threat if it were to be usurped for malevolent use? How long will it take in the best guesstimate to convert that to malevolent use? What is the level of technical complexity and cost to convert? And here is a clear distinction again between the life sciences and the physical sciences. If you or I wish to produce a nuclear device in our basement, we will, we will be visited very quickly. We'll be very visited very quickly, not only because there are discernible signatures for our activity, people know what to look for, and these are high cost capital items. Biotech is very different. Biotech can be merged against the ubiquity of the science and embedded in any one of a broad, broad variety of academic, governmental, and industrial institutions. And then what are the, even if the risk is real, even if it can be converted, can we at least monitor it? Because that can mitigate. So I would say that you could begin to think about a risk scale in which one has is the threat extreme, namely that if someone does this, there's a great threat to us and others in the short term? Is it disruptive? Are the countermeasures available to it? Or is this something we don't accord any risk assessment to whatsoever? So multiplying that against the next box, is it short term, mid term, long term? Pick your own definition there, but at least a year scale. And then what is the index of technical complexity and the cost? to convert. So very high would be the question of the genesis of your nuclear weapon. The question of would the genesis of the application of directed evolution to modify the catalytic capability of a particular enzyme that could be disruptive to certain elements of agriculture uh, be as compelling an exercise is one to be examined and then what are the robust mechanisms or lack of to monitor and test those? Do we have a high confidence that we could detect that someone was doing something abusive? Are those frameworks emerging or are they unavailable? And out of that, you would get some sort of risk index, which I can't quantify per se, but I think it's the way we've got to start thinking. But overwhelmingly, ladies and gentlemen, and I think it'll resonate with some of the other views you're here, I think we've got to be a lot more proactive in our own engagement in thinking about these challenges and our advocacy in emphasizing benefit 
not denying risk in a mindless way, but nonetheless creating a transparent identification of application, cogent strategies for risk mitigation, and equally important, be prepared for the unpleasant task, and it's not pleasant to have to go into the public arena to counter the distortions of activist uh, groups. We must puncture this myth that zero risk is attainable, but in short, active engagement in policy formulation, and we must demand that policies and regulations are based upon evidence rather than expedient political populism, whether from Hollywood or Washington. Over a century ago, the German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck said, politics is the art of the possible, the calculated science of survival. His arch enemy, and this was a narrative from the Berlin Academy of Sciences, his arch enemy was the distinguished professor Rudolf Virchow, the founding father of uh, cellular pathology. And he rose, obviously, with great aristocratic splendor because they all were at that stage and they did, in fact, wear morning coats and uh, they, they had ties, unlike today's audience. And the other issue was his retort to Bismarck was as follows. Sir, Survival owes little to the art of politics, but everything to the calculated application of science. Ladies and gentlemen, we live that life. Let us make sure that we ensure it has a viability by our greater engagement. Thank you very much. I think what we're going to do is, a couple of people already uh, ready to ask questions, we welcome those, but I think, Roger, you're going to go next for a couple of minutes and then uh, hear from the panelists, and we'll come back uh, to questions. Roger? Yeah, I can. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I'll do it from the podium, assuming okay. somebody can work that. Yeah. Is this yeah, of course. Oh, it's the down key. Okay. Yeah, um, Wow. To, uh, to, uh, to build on that, I guess my first uh, impression from what you said, George, is that you threw out um, a uh, description of how um, this would need to play out in the political world, which is beyond the capabilities of most of us in the room and our sophistication. Um, and I thought that it's a good dovetail because what I'm going to I was proposing something uh, a little uh, milder and a little less ambitious yesterday, and I've tweaked that. And I'd like to show two slides on that, and perhaps this can be a way that um, this, the people who believe in this in this room could kind of work their way up to being able to engage in a, in a dialogue with George, uh, you know, on, on somewhat equal footing. So my, you know, so this is, I'm revisiting yesterday, uh, and now I'm, uh, I'm, I'm changing a little. I'm saying your strategy to address the perceived risks of developing this field, I'm now saying it has three parts. The first part, so far missing, is that you articulate a vision of the possible benefits from developing this field. And it's a compelling vision. Now, second thing, and I'll show this on a second slide, this is a new point, that you articulate distinctions between imaginable consequential activities that you would like to see and those that you would not like to see. Yesterday's example was of resynthesized SARS with a conotoxin on it. I don't particularly want to see that uh, emerge as a result of uh, the activity of an undergraduate engineering class at MIT or any other university. Then as in yesterday, you assemble a set of normative and technical tactics, um, the, the ways that you think, um, things you think you can do. And you're trying to hit the following bar. You're trying to be able to convince other people that by using these tactics, you can tend to bring about the activities you do want and that you can discourage those that you do not want. Okay, so that's, that's just next. So I'm going to give examples of that. So, you know, so, you know, maybe this makes it less daunting. Let's slice up the space of things that uh, one might want or not along some line. So, for example, and again, I'm not, I'm not pushing any of this, one might say that one wants to encourage the development of synthetic biology on uh, prokaryotes, but begin drawing a line at eukaryotes, or begin drawing a line at yeast, discouraging higher eukaryotes, or to encourage model organisms and discourage work on anything that isn't an approved model organism, particularly a pathogen. Here's another slice. This is a more, this is a kind of hardcore biology slice, but this has resonance to me during the meeting. Actually, I think these things that are being done in bacteria to get 
pieces of bacteria to, bacteria to talk to one another. Maybe you want to draw the line outside of bacteria, what we call cell autonomy. Maybe we want to encourage construction of artifacts whose action is limited to that of a single cell or records things that impinge upon it, but to discourage, at least in eukaryotes, those that are non-cell autonomous. So no fancy communication schemes reprogramming the mouse immune system just quite yet. Might be that line. Another one, which I, now this one, this one makes a lot of sense to me. I think you want to draw the line, perhaps, right now, at horizontal transmissibility. The artifacts that we make will not be designed to move or be movable by things found in nature from one cell to the other. Okay, you have no reason to make the things you make infectious, contagious. Or perhaps you don't. And then another dichotomy would be, you know, we don't, we, well, we, you know, I said yesterday, you don't want to do anything to keep a, a glamorous outlaw hacker culture from arising, but actually we can parse that. We don't care about GFP facial tattoos. And if there's a GFP facial tattoo outlaw hacker gene tattoo parlor, you know, maybe some of you think it's cool. You know, I'm, I'm neutral to that. But, um, you know, you want to discourage the same people who work in the GFP tattoo shop from, you know, making RNA viruses. So, so the, if you go, just put the up arrow, George. Yeah, just, so that's, that's, I'm proposing that maybe along these lines, if there's a discussion that percolates, it can begin to rise to the level at which uh, this community could have an intelligent conversation with George. Brad, do you want to go next? Yeah, let me, I'll just make a few comments, I think, um, you know, that will end up probably re re recapitulating some of the things that, that George said and, and Roger, but I try to sort of bring it down to what maybe folks in the audience might think about, what, well, what could I do about this? Um, you know, George is sort of been at 30,000 feet, Roger's been maybe at about 10,000 feet, and I'll see maybe if I can bring it down to, you know, 20 or 30 stories high. And, you know, because I think one of the things that's really important to recognize when you think about, you know, how science and the technologies, the really incredible technologies that you're working on that have really fantastic promise. And I, I mean, I, I you know, in the two years or so that I've known Roger and Drew and, and others in the, in the audience who've been working on this field, I think it's one of the most exciting realms of biology for doing really great things in the future. Uh, you know, and I think Jay Keesling's talk uh, that led up to this was a fantastic example of what kind of potential this has for really changing the world and changing the way that, you know, health, for example, and other things, uh, energy perhaps, and the environment can really be changed by having biology do work for you instead of in, in sort of a more engineered manner, not just the individual pieces of art. Um, so I think that's really, really exciting, and I think in that light, what I, what my sort of motivation is to make sure that that field, that this field, can move on quickly and continue moving forward and be successful and really provide value to society. Because, I mean, that's, you know, I think as, as George said, I mean, that's sort of one of, the, one of the benefits and drivers of science is that it provides incredible value to society and has historically. Um, and so I think, you know, given the, the concept of risk and, and this kind of technology and the amount of uncertainty and as, as, as George appropriately said, the sort of em embryonic nature of the science, I mean, you look at all these the talks, and you see all these little bits and pieces, like that's really cool, and that's really cool, and we can, but we need to sort of, you know, if we just can plug them all together, we can start really doing really great things. Um, you know, but given that sort of uncertainty, you don't really know where it's going, what do you do, what do you, when you think about risk? Well, you know, risk is a huge, huge issue. I mean, you know, I, I think we were talking with someone earlier today, I think it was maybe Eric Eisenstadt, saying, well, you know, when, when you think about risk in biology, you know, it's pretty much anything you can imagine you could do perhaps. Certainly maybe in 10 or 20 years that's probably more likely than today, but nonetheless, you know, it's, it's anything and everything from the bad to the great, from the really bad to the really great. Um, and I think that given that uncertainty, well, what do you do about it? You know, how is a scientist working in a lab, you know, that you want to do good things, the reason you got into science is to do really great work and really help, you know, to learn a lot, uh, sort of benefit, you know, sort of provide new knowledge and also to benefit society. And I think, you know, so what should you do about that given that context? And I think that that first of all, it's discussions like this, and I think, you know, again, I've said again and again, you know, the leadership provided by some of the folks who are running this conference today and others that I've gotten to know, and their sort of acknowledgement that this is an important conversation to have is really, really critical. You know, most scientific fields, you know, certainly in biology, you know, there's some examples of Silomar and other places, didn't really do that. And, you know, I think that's too bad. And you see some, some things that, you know, suffered as a result of it, for example, genetically, genetically modified organisms, agriculture, things like that, where there was not this sort of humbleness, this sort of thing, well, let's really cons be concerned about this and talk about it openly and, and let's really sort of look into the p potential downside of what we're doing. 
and you know that potential really great benefit to society or to the world it has been severely impaired because of the way that when the technology was initially introduced uh, the way it was sort of rolled out to society um, in, a, in a way that was suboptimal to say the least um, so I think this kind of conversation and sort of trying to sort of get folks like yourself to think about these issues are really just important you know and I just to sort of um, talk about you know what is a policymaker and who are these people and, and what are they doing these guys down in Washington DC you know these are people who they have a lot of things they need to balance um, they need to balance uh, basically health of the public security of the public security of the environment the economy uh, and then also science technology and how that can sort of feed into all those other things I mean they have really big responsibilities and they have to sort of in an ideal world uh, not all politics is ideal uh, but in an ideal world and I think most of them try hard to, to do this at least on their good days um, is to really try to try to find the balance that's really good for society that really is good for the health and, and safety of the public that's really good for the environment good for economy and those things sort of move up and down depending on you know who that per who that specific member of Congress, for example, is and what they feel is more or less important. And so given that sort of, you know, so science, when you think about you guys, you do science. That's what you do. And you think it's important. And it is important. But, you know, just, just keep in the back of your mind when you're thinking about, you know, as, as George says, to engage, uh, be very proactive in this, to, to realize that, you know, these people have lots of other constituents. They have lots of other things that they have to balance when they think about what is a good policy decision. Um, or what's the appropriate policy decision. And so just keep that in mind as you, as you do, as I hope many of you will, begin engaging and having these conversations and trying to sort of, you know, as, as George really appropriately says, you know, try to have these conversations with policymakers that, you know, they have many, there are many things going on behind the scenes, but, you know, behind their eyeballs when you're talking with them, mm -hmm. there's sort of, sort of conversations and things moving around that really just, just be, be acknowledgement of that. So if, if the answer doesn't come out the way that you think, in your world, sitting in your lab, or you know, your calculation says, well, you know, that's the way the world works, and so you have to sort of be acknowledging that and sort of work in that context. Uh, you know, and so so that sort of piece, the sort of soft power piece of you know, how can we kind of get out there and and and, and uh, engage is one thing, and then it's sort of well, what can you actually do in your lab? And, and again, I'll go back to Jay and Jay Kiesling and the work that he's doing, where he's taken something and chose when he could have chosen lots of other things to do, but chose to. Um, to really try to, to move towards something that could have a significant social value and really decrease the, cr the cost of a really important drug. And I should also add another piece that he didn't talk about is the relationship that he built with uh, an organization called the Institute of One World Health that actually the idea, this is a, a rather interesting foundation, nonprofit pharmaceutical company. And, what, and th the idea here is that Jay's going to do this really great science, but he's built this partnership to actually create a real-world product that can help people. That once that science is done, once he gets that second order, two more, two more orders of magnitude, you know, there's going to be a, a system and a process and an organization built up to roll that out. And I think that's an important sort of connection when you think about the work that you do. There's lots of great science that you guys all are going to do and have done. Um, but just think about, well, what's the next step after that great science? You know, well, maybe I'll you know, spin off a company. I don't know. But you know, just really, you know, really think about how can I move that out and actually change the world, actually get something out there that can really add value? That's um, not just some sort of really cool, I got a bunch of papers and then sort of you know, sat there and then you just sort of got some more papers and got some more papers, which you know, there's value to that as well. But I would encourage folks to really think about how can you really sort of bring that down to the ground level and really get something on the ground that can help people. So sort of trying to build those sort of capabilities in the kind of science you do with, that has really good social value. And then finally, I mean, when we think about risk, and the work that I do focuses a lot on, on um, sort of uh, bioterrorism, emerging infectious diseases, trying to sort of control epidemics and manage epidemics and build the tools and the talent base needed to really essentially eliminate lethality, mass lethality from large scale epidemics. And that's everything from medicine, public health, public policy to basic science and research. Um, and I think when you think about how do you respond to epidemics, and this is sort of my bias, is my sort of it's what I think is the importance and the real value of what you guys are doing is that you have a real great opportunity to build systems, be it something like Artemisinin or even things more uh, exotic that we, could, that we could talk about, that could really change the way that we respond to infectious disease, change the way that we produce antibiotics, change the way that we can rapidly respond to epidemics. And I think that, you know, trying to sort of as a community build 
uh, sort of as a, sort of a vision of victory of what what should this community shoot for in the in the biggest picture and sort of try to motivate folks to build sort of broad capabilities that will help us respond to infectious disease, help us to respond either ahead of time to build up the rather un, sort of dwindling uh, products and anti-infective drugs that are in the pipeline in big pharma due to lots of economic and other things. I mean, I think of the 506 drugs that are estimated to be in, in development today in, in industry, only about six are antibiotics and none of them are new mechanisms of action. I mean, that's a really grim view of sort of the future of anti-infectives coming out of the pipeline. And so thinking about what can we do about that uh, and how can we sort of help to build a foundation, a technology foundation that will allow us to respond in a, in a really um, uh, different kind of way, in a revolutionary kind of way to infectious disease, I think would be a, a huge contribution from this community. It's something that I would just encourage all of you to think about as you're trying to think about, you know, how can we mitigate these risks? How can, as, as Roger says, have a, a good vision of what we're doing this for and why this is important and why this, you know, benefit outweighs the cost or the risk risk-benefit analysis, and I think so trying to really think about those things in, uh, in a very constructive way I think would be really, really important. Thank you, Brad. I know we've got a couple of questions, and while the mics are going to those in individuals, I know there's one at the back and one to the side. Uh, another element that does loom large in Washington, and you may view it as uh, absolutely myopic and misplaced paranoia, but I suppose one way to p paraphrase it is would you want your paper to end up with yellow underlining markers uh, in the hands of uh, uh, a, a terrorist group and those papers are actually found when the special operations forces go in? Because that has in fact, that has in fact happened uh, on several occasions of late and that has is, that is weighed very heavily on a number of uh, legislators. Uh, in fact, there were several papers from, the, uh, from Afghanistan which were of uh, that, that kind, but they run out of highlighters, so they didn't highlight the important bits. But uh, anyway, question at the back. Uh, so along those lines, another uh, Blue Heron Prize essay inspired by Roger Brent. Um, so we take uh, Integron with several antibiotic resistance cassettes and then add in all known antibiotic resistance genes, transfer this to a pathogen, and then release it in a selective media, in this case, a hospital. And then for George, uh, I apologize, but I'm going to ask you the same questions you asked us. It, it seems clear that in our capitalist society, there is no way to stop research and to human enhancement due to the demand. Uh, how can we navigate this technology, and how can we have e equity in its dissemination? Do you want to take the easy bit, Roger, the pathogen? I, um, yeah, I, I think that's a great question, and I want to uh, let it hang in the air where while I... I'm going to suggest something maybe less ambitious. Um, if people in this room, how can they contribute to being part of a solution, either to Brad Smith's um, defense against uh, math's lethality in an epidemic, or, back to your question now, I'm going to throw it back, uh, because I can't answer it, how can people here contribute to bringing about uh, an order in which there is more equity? by doing what they want to do, which is, you know, building logic gates and stuff like that. Show me a path, and I will do everything I can to help you guys go down that path. No, I mean, I mean, if we as a group of uh, putative Dr. Evils were to retire to the uh, library, uh, we could certainly discern and hold endless conferences on the list of theoretical constructs that we could make, which I think would be feasible within a one to two year time frame, uh, and, but I think it, uh, that aspect of it has to be acknowledged and therefore what are the types of surveillance mechanisms that we need to put in place. I mean, I think if any of you read Ken Alabeck's book, Biohazard, with substantially less technological sophistication than anything that's available in this room today, so going back two decades, the Russians had certainly been able to conduct using brute force uh, genomic manipulation of organisms, any one of a number of quite sinister modifications from antibiotic resistance on upwards. And I think that threat spectrum will just change. But as I said, I think the threat spectrum will eventually move well beyond bugs. As to your broader question with regard to uh, human enhancement and eugenics, I think that the hubris of mankind is such that it has an inevitability. Uh, so I do not hold to the view that it will be uh, held in check. 
uh, and I think it's probably likely that economic drivers will be the factors in that. And I think in the Palace of Truth, I'm not even sure many of us would hold back uh, bestowment of a perceived advantage on our children or grandchildren if we felt there was a robust technology that advantaged them, if we had the type of socioeconomic largesse which we all do sitting in this room. So I cannot be uh, uh, optimistic about that, but in another way, I'm not... I, I'm not pessimistic with regard to the outcomes of that in relation to humans. Others may be, and I respect their view. What is much more problematic is this issue of equity. Long before we get to the applications of technology, it is the question of two and a half billion uh, people on the face of the earth with less than ten dollars a day, uh, a billion people with less than a dollars a day, and the fundamental triad of poverty, disease, and illiteracy those are the challenges of the next uh, 50 years. We may have to wrestle with enhancement and eugenics within the economic cocoon of the G8 and the G1 in particular, but I think it will happen. Uh, inevitable. Hi. Um, uh, Oliver, you had a question. Sorry. Okay. Where is the next question? Here. Sorry, my apologies. Hi. Uh, can you put up your minus one, two slide, the one that has the product of a bunch of factors? Because I'd like to comment on that. Uh, it's disappeared. Oh, well. Okay. I think it, it left out an important consideration, which is that there is a danger to not doing something sure. that may be just as big as the danger of doing something or, you know, that there's, and in, in particular, because as you point out, biology is quite different from something like nuclear weapons. It is the case. Not, it's not a question of it, it might be. It is the case that in, say, 10 years, people will be able to make nasty things in their kitchens. And as a consequence, nasty things will get out. And so and, and by, surveillance by itself is not the issue. The issue is go, they will get out, and the important thing to do is to figure out ways of mitigating them extremely fast. The only way we could possibly arrange that is by having a cadre of very well-educated people who are on the good guy side. Okay. And that's why I, uh, I think that that's particularly what's missing from your equation of risk. If we don't do the work we're doing now, we uh, have the risk of having these bad things getting out and killing a substantial portion of the world. No, that's perfectly valid, but uh, the, the issue was clearly on the left-hand side of the slide was availability of countermeasures. And uh, that's exactly what you're enunciating, so that's clearly recognizes the vital import, but what we, what we have to be very careful of, because it doesn't sell with the legislative community, is the simple trust us issue, and that if we place any form of constraint, somehow we will suddenly grind the apparatus of science and technological progress, we'll throw absolute sand in the gears that nothing will happen. That's beginning to sound a little hollow to many people. Yeah, if I Project. could, Jerry, uh, this, I, I, I didn't show it at the last minute here, but what I'd like to hear better articulated, because basically I believe it, is how creation of a kind of hacker-type culture and the infusion of that wonderful culture with its emphasis on playfulness and, and all the other good things about it, how that can be infused to become part of the solution. You don't want to train everybody here in a pharmaceutical company. That would kill the very wonderful thing. But, you know, so what's the right balance between letting this develop as an engineering discipline with all its internal aesthetic and interfacing with the world outside? Maybe everybody at the end of their postdoc spends a year in a pharmaceutical company so that they know how those guys think. They're repelled by it, but they go off and do it. But, you know, I, but I, you know show me a path by which this stuff can become part of the solution. Yeah, yeah. I have a question. I have a question. How do you um, how, how do you get uh, international harmonization when you mention that um, you have regulatory systems that embrace both rational and irrational decision frameworks? And to some to some extent, what's rational for us is considered completely irrational to the Europeans, and vice versa. Again, no simple answer. I think it highlights it. I mean, you only have to look at the, just even go within the map of Europe itself in relation to the stem cell debate. Some countries are completely permissive with regard to it. Some, some are completely prohibitive. And the United Kingdom is the most prohibit, per, permissive in terms of actually allowing 
direct propagation of embryos specifically for the purposes, <laughs> not just harvest in spare embryos. No, there's no easy answer. It's, uh, but I think what you have seen, though, is the fact that it is possible to achieve international harmonization. We did it in relation to, as far as possible, counter-proliferation in the nuclear arena. We have done it in relation to things of codes of maritime piracy, aircraft hijacking, and other things. So it is, it is possible. It's difficult. Uh, and undoubtedly, we're defining a number of desired characteristics, many of which are difficult to attain. But nonetheless, uh, it, it becomes an important dimension that we try and chart and build in from the outset as quickly as possible. Any proactive steps, harmonization needs to be overlaid on it. Oliver? Uh, I was struck, George, by when you were saying that we will need a major catastrophe, not just because it's rather a striking thing to say, um, but because I was at a climate change meeting last week where exactly the same thing was said. <laughs> Um, and I'm not sure how we will survive all the catastrophes we need. Um, but uh, one, of the, um, one of the answers, and I speak somewhat self-interestedly as, as a member of the media, is you have to define your catastrophe. And Jay described to us that there is a catastrophe. There is a major catastrophe right now in that 10 million people every year die of easily avoidable diseases Absolutely. in developing countries. And, well... But once, again, but once we come back again, though, to the veneer of privilege that we retreat behind, and so my enunciation of the two catastrophes which I view at hand, partly built upon what Roger and Brad have already said, which will be the relentless growth of antibiotic resistance such that by the end of this decade, devoid of any new meaningful antibiotics entering the therapeutic armamentarium, we will be in heavy white water and notwithstanding any manip malevolent manipulative events, hence why I said low probability, high consequence, uh, at some point some genetic reassortment of avian, porcine and human influenza genes is going to spawn something quite nasty, whether it be one year from now or 25 years from now. So my, my point is just simply the readjustment in society relative to an understanding of risk-benefit. Um, my, my point w was rather more that it is possible... And that's possible. why I have a bunker in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but my, my point was rather, rather more that yeah. it is actually possible to redefine what is seen yeah. as catastrophic. Absolutely. And, and a good example of this is cornea transplants in Britain in the 1950s, where blindness, where, which were massively resisted by the yeah. public, yeah. but blindness due to corneal defects was turned into a great issue by one newspaper, by the Daily Mirror, and managed to, basically, one set of editorial people managed to change the entire national policy and save a lot of people's sight. And so, if you can make things that are wrong with the world now seem catastrophic, or be seen for the catastrophes they are, that's part of your solution rather than waiting for a new catastrophe to come uh, Absolutely, but I think we also need the counter, and clearly uh, opposition to corneal transplants is not the, the nature of the thrust which I'm developing. It is also the distortive effect of celebrity endorsement too, uh, <laughs> that can uh, so distort things. Yes, sir, I think you had a question. We have a question oh, here. So, first, Ten years ago, there was in circulation here in Cambridge something called the Biologist Pledge. Um, and the Biologist Pledge uh, acknowledged and foresaw that biology could have applications of a military and nasty nature. And it noted that it was an inherently bad idea, not only for technical reasons and the fact that biological agents, particularly ones designed to be nasty, will have a nasty tendency to turn around and bite you on the ass, um, but also, you know, from more moral and humanitarian perspectives, just a bad idea. At the same time, the benefits of biomedical research are considerable and compelling. And uh, the biologist pledge was a, a purely personal pledge. Um, that you as a scientist would not yourself engage in, in your research or your teaching, um, the pursuit of those dark ends. Um, and I think it had a lot of value, uh, both to raise it as an issue and to allow people, should they choose at least, to make a personal commitment um, on that front. And so I think um, that is, in, in my opinion, the most effective device I've seen um, um, for addressing um, the darker issues. Uh, Jonathan King, 
um, at MIT was uh, important in discussing and facilitating and bringing forward the biologist pledge, and I suggest we might be able to dig that thing back out and discuss it tomorrow um, in greater detail. Then the second issue is that George brought forth the importance of flexible and adaptive standards. Um, and in contrast, I think Brent suggested some possible guidelines which were not flexible and not adaptive, but were rather um, 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 they involved technical lines that wouldn't be crossed, like no eukaryotes. Okay. Um, Encourage and, versus and, discourage. Uh, right. Yeah. And, and so I would I would argue that um, um, that kind of thing is not adaptive, not flexible, and that it runs the risk of turning uh, 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 synthetic biology into uh, uh, an area which is perhaps harmless but also irrelevant. Um, that many of the as applications, opposed to the present state. Well, that that <laughs> many no, but many of the applications um, that have the most promise might indeed require. Uh, implementation in eukaryotes and might require other aspects um, that were on your list of um, um, unacceptable. Um, so I think we need a more flexible framework. Um, and the malevolence benevolence um, issue is closer to the heart. The Belmont Report, um, which is the current standard of ethical research, Belmont Report is a report um, from the National Institutes of Health, and it has to do particularly with um, ethical guidelines for um, research involving humans, but I think it's really quite a bit broader than that and very relevant to what we're discussing here. Um, and it has three main principles, which are extremely flexible and broad, um, but nonetheless compelling. Uh, the first, and, and you can just do Google for the Belmont Report, and you can pull this up on the web. Um, the first is respect for persons. Um, and says so you need to acknowledge the autonomy of persons and protect um, persons with diminished autonomy, children, the mentally ill, so on and so on. Um, and the usual implication in uh, biomedical research is that you have to have informed consent. And the other implication might be um, in our sort of situation uh, that you would abide by uh, the appropriate local rules and regulations and so on and so on and have respect for the will of the people as manifested by appropriate government um, regulations. The second principle is one of beneficence, explicitly beneficence. Um, and um, it's often formulated to say that you must maximize the benefits and minimize the harms, um, which is extremely relevant and helpful there. And the third um, is the principle of justice um, and it lists several formulations um, which have been suggested from time to time and alternatively and, and somewhat not necessarily equally compatible with each other of uh, equal shares to each person or to those most in need um, or to those um, um, who put forth the most effort or uh, for their societal contribution or according to merit or so on and so on. Um, but this also addresses to some degree um, the issues of um, third world need and first world privilege, um, which have also been raised, particularly by George. Um, so I think, um, to some, the Belmont Report is worth reading and thinking about and establishes, I think, very helpful principles and guidelines. It and does. It contains a number of very valuable points, but there's one fundamental distinction, and that is the fact that it is an oversight mechanism which, as you rightly said, embraces the need for consent, namely someone evaluates whether or not the proposed research embraces those three principles. What we have in the fundamental research arena is no such oversight as an IRB. No one actually asks the question. So if you take some of the core celeb of late, did anyone ask whether putting the interleukin-4 gene into ectromelia and then suddenly recoil in horror when you totally decimate the immune system while having then provided clearly an open key mechanism for simply modifying smallpox to do the same thing. There was no oversight. That's the distinction between clinical research and basic research. That's the fundamental issue. And although your point about code of conduct 
is very legitimate and compelling. I think we can all have senses of identification with it. There is a final lack of accountability for many in science. If you look at, if you've been at the National Academy meeting on January 9th, 2003, in which some of these core celeb examples like Ectromelia IL-4, complement fixation proteins in smallpox, the de novo synthesis of polio uh, were debated. The level of revisionist history which was on display there was quite remarkable insofar as all the risk had apparently been defined a priori, which they clearly hadn't, because clearly anyone who went and synthesized polio de novo had then essentially, as several observers have pointed out, has essentially eliminated the prospect ever of polio being the second organism after smallpox to be eradicated from the world because someone can now go ahead and synthesize it, and if we're not immunizing people against it and have no herd immunity, then in fact it becomes a devastating weapon. Uh, but the overall issue, I think, is the fact that where does the oversight come? So if you had a Belmont, well, we're going to have to go on because yeah. of time. The institutional review boards are yeah, a familiar can... and perhaps acceptable format or model. Um, for areas of research in which these questions arise. I think there are parallels and we should perhaps yeah. take it so, up afterwards. So let's, got, let's, let's yeah. go on. Um, yeah. let's, first, let's thank George right. and Brad and Roger. Uh, we're going to have um, about a half hour um, uh, perspective from Paul Rabinow, after which time we'll be able to continue the conversation. So want to want to keep moving uh, first I want to thank uh, Drew and everyone else for inviting me uh, this is obviously an extremely important event that will be it in one way or another historical and um, uh, I'm both honored and, and uh, petrified to be here. So that's one, and uh, echoing the sense of what am I doing here that several other speakers had said, I will repeat that. And two, then following George Post's remarks, um, which I uh, entirely agreed with, I find much of what I have to say has been covered. And I thought of just leaving in fear, but I uh, <laughs> decided instead that what I'll, t after one preliminary remark, I will read what I've written because I think it's also important, and this is kind of the bottom line of the relevant side of the humanities, because I'm a professor, I'm a professor of anthropology in America, but in Europe I'm a philosopher, um, and. Um, there is something to be said about the humanistic scholarships, which seems to be, again, radically lacking. There may well be a huge lacuna in the scientific uh, records that are in revisionism that's taken place. But to go back to the Belmont report and to resuscitate the failed Kantianism, the failed utilitarianism, and the failed Rawlsianism, um, I bought two books recently at your bookstore here, one by uh, two famous Harvard uh, philosophers, Stanley Cavell and Hilary Putnam. They both agree that those approaches are bankrupt. And therefore, we could talk more technically about why that's the case, but going back to touchy-feely nice humanism or utilitarianism has been tried for two centuries. So uh, we need something a little bit more rigorous and a little bit more um, savant, as the French say, than that. So <coughs> let me uh, say one or two things, read the paper quickly, and head for the hills. Um, uh, first, I'm happy to announce that I, myself and two of my students were just turned down by the National Science Foundation for a grant on uh, exploring uh, biosecurity considerations because one of my distinguished politically correct colleagues in the social sciences said, of course, there is no biosecurity threat and created by Bush, and anybody who thinks there is one is clearly just a dupe of the, of the establishment. So I'm <coughs> your local dupe. Um, and um, so that's the resentment, uh, resentiment part. The three, the, three terms, the three terms from George's talk, however, that I think I would pick up that maybe we can go over in discussion, but I think were completely unexamined, were society, the public, and God. And again, this is where, where scholarship comes in. I don't have the time to do it here. But societies, as Marilyn Strathern at Cambridge is showing us, are created. They don't exist. They're not natural organisms. 
And part of what's emerged out of the recent debates around a variety of things like cloning is publics in, uh, on the one hand and so-called society on the other, which basically usually amounts to public opinion polling, um, are created entities which need to be given a good deal more examination before they're naturalized and black boxed as if they really existed. They don't. They're made, they're created, they're active, they're changeable, etc. And that's an avenue into where some of the change that we're talking about can take place. And then, although I am a New York cosmopolitan atheist myself, I think a lot of the garbage that's said about playing God is, is blasphemous and ridiculous, and that if any, people wanted to spend some time, and there are, of course, many scholars who have, on God, which is not my terrain, as I say, but I recommend people like Hans Blumenberg, the idea that what's passed off as playing God has anything to do with theology is, again, one of the more ridiculous signs of our barbaric lack of education and, and, and um, a, a culture. And this goes back to me, uh, and then I'll read the paper, to one of the core problems. The, the educational system of the United States uh, was destroyed by first the American Medical Association in the 1950s and then finished off by Sputnik. And there is no general education in this society, and hence it's perfectly possible for people to uh, proceed through a whole range of debates with, without any of the tools to do it. Now, that doesn't guarantee that humanistic education and serious uh, uh, struggling with Kant's fundamental principles and the metaphysics of morals is going to solve these problems for you, but it does mean that it would at least put a little damper on reinventing the wheel in the sense that if I were to get up here and talk about biology as it, in a pre-Darwinian mode, many of you would be offended. But it's perfectly permissible to do it when you come to other domains because, after all, they don't count. So um, that's the plea for a renewed educational system. Roger Brent and I are teaching a course uh, for a second time around called the Anthropology of Genomics biology and, and citizenship in the making at Berkeley. We urge, and of course, almost no biology students take it. Um, and um, there, there are multiple dimensions of what could be done, and it needs some, some support. So call your congressman. OK, I'm now going to read this paper, which is going to be in a different language than what we've been hearing so far, although I think almost every single point that George and the other two panelists made is something I touch on. And if there's time, we can open up a, a broader uh, discussion. The paper is uh, uh, called An Ecology of Ignorance, which I think characterizes the fundamental situation we're in right now, and I take this from the German philosopher and uh, sociologist Niklas Luhmann. Uh, Luhmann, in a book of essays entitled Observations on Modernity, published by Stanford, Stanford University Press, provides acute reflections on how does the future appear today? What is its modality? and how should a social analyst observe this process? The quick answers are, one, the future appears as a contingent set of possibilities about which decisions are demanded. Decisions are demanded because the future appears as something about which we must do something, remembering, as was just said, that non-action is an action and not choosing is a choice. That's point one. Two, social analysts Social analysis consists in observing observers observing. What is observed in the geno genomics world are trend spotters, spin specialists, advisors, facilitators, counselors, ethicists, cultural critics of science and technology, and an occasional anthropologist. This manner of posing things foregrounds the legitimacy of expertise as both necessary and dubious. That is to say, as problematic. However, if we can't depend on experts, then who should, what, would, who, what should we do, or said another way, in addition to experts, whom? Part one of four parts, these are taken from much longer papers. I'm giving you a little bits, and I'll be try to explicate them in questions if you would like. Part one, mode. In an es another essay entitled Describing the Future, Luhmann addresses the issue of what form the future is being given today as well as what forms prediction about it take in a society that understands itself to be ever accelerating. And for the record, Luhmann's conception of society is quite different than anything that's been used around here. Although our times abound in futurologists, prophets, and prognosticators, it is hard to take them seriously, as we actually have very little sense of what a future not yet visible in the present would look like in any detail. 
Two of my favorite confirmatory examples are the world historical failure of all the experts to predict how the Soviet empire would end, and although a multitude of volumes now purport to show how that end was inevitable. And second, the fact that during several years, Bill Gates missed the import of the internet. Perhaps posing the question of the future in terms of form rather than content will produce sociologically more powerful insights. Luhmann argues that the only genre of answer to this question that should be taken seriously is one that turns on the future appearing as contingent. One that, for that very reason, compels incessant decisions and reformulations. As never before, the continuity from past to future is broken in our time. However, the one thing we do know is that much of what will be true in future presence will depend on our current decisions. Decide now. To further complicate the picture, we don't have anyone who really can decide. It so happens that we live at a time in which the social authority of experts has been undermined by their oft-proven inability either to forecast the future or to make it happen as they envision. Luhmann, Luhmann calls that which has taken place, taken the place of authority, quote, the politics of understanding. Understandings are negotiated provisos that can be re relied upon for a given time. Such understandings do not imply consensus, nor do they represent reasonable or even correct solutions to problems. What they do do is attempt to fix reference points. Reference points are those things that are removed from argument for further, for further controversies in which coalitions and opp oppositions can form anew. One might call this politics of commonplaces, in the sense Aristotle used it, understood in the old tradition of rhetoric as the starting point for arguments. Understandings have one big advantage over the claims of authority. They cannot be discredited, but can only be constantly renegotiated. Finally, their value does not increase, but only decreases with age. This helps to explain why we continue to turn to experts whose predictions of 20 years ago now look ridiculous. They may have been wrong, but at least they're helpful in framing a discussion. Of course, following the media whirlwind, everyone agrees that cloning is vitally important. The president wants a position soon. Hurry, let's have a weighty discussion about its future impact. Round up the usual value spokespeople and be sure a broad spectrum of views is represented. Express concern. Issue a report. For us, the present refers to the future that only exists at what is, as what is probable or improbable. Said another way, the form of the future is the form of probability that directs a two-sided observation as something more or less probable or more or less improbable with the distribution of these modalities across everything that is possible. The present can calculate a future that can always turn out otherwise. The present can, in this way, always assure itself that it calculated correctly, even if things turn out differently. Such a, such a situation does not rule out prognoses. In fact, it incessantly demands them. But its only worth lies in the quickness with which it can be corrected, or more commonly, simply forgotten. There exists, therefore, only a provisional foresight whose function is found in the form it provides for a quick adjustment to a reality that comes to be other than what was then expected. It is in such a situation that one finds the modern type of expert. That is, someone who, when asked questions he or she cannot answer, responds, but in a mode that can be led back to a mode of respectable uncertainty. With a little distance, experts and counter-experts as types appear to be equally convincing and equally plausible. Their assertions about the future equally unconvincing and equally implausible. It is desired that they have transparent interests and values. Their opinions count because we know who they represent, whom. Negotiations can then be defined as an attempt to increase uncertainty to the, to the point that the only remaining reasonable opinion is communicating with one another. However, as we do not have the unlimited time, a la Habermas, that would be required to reach non-distorted agreement, we find ourselves in a quandary. Responsibility to ignorance. In another essay entitled The Ecology of Ignorance, Luhmann further specifies the place we reflexive moderns find ourselves in. 
we move in a situation of systemic ignorance. Some of this ignorance is produced knowingly, but some is not. Precisely because of the form we have given to the future, we are by necessity within an ecology of ignorance. This point does not imply that we need a better map of what we don't know so that we can go about acquiring the requisite knowledge in an ever more comprehensive fashion. Rather, it means that there are inherently volatile, temporally unfolding spaces of ignorance that do not require filling in as they were not always there and there will always be more of them. These spaces are differentially distributed and are, of course, saturated by partially volatile and partially frozen sets of power relations. What is appropriate is a reflexive acknowledgement that an ecology of partial and permanent ignorance is the social and political ecology in which we live, labor, and talk. Such an acknowledgement would have important consequences. First, it would further deflate the authority of those making futuristic pronouncements. Can you remember back less than a decade when debate around mapping <coughs> the genome turned amazingly enough, on the alternatives of the genome as holy grail, leading to an everlasting health, versus genomic mapping as leading to an inevitable backdoor to eugenics, as Troy Duster put it. One can simply observe that those making such assertions had no possible knowledge on which to base such claims. Such claims fluctu fluctuate between tautologies. The rich will benefit from this, whatever the this is. To hype, a new age of medicine is dawning, quote, within a decade, or more frequently now, within two years. But why is there so much debate about things we cannot know about now? To pose the question is to answer it. These platitudes and cliches should be seen as attempts to fix reference points for debate and communication. They are part of a sociological essential hype that prognosticative observers of science and society can now not operate without. Lumont puts this insight bluntly, quote, the intensity of ecological communication is based on ignorance, that the future is unknowable is expressed in the present as communication. Society is irritated, but has only one way to react to its irritation, in its own manner of operative communication, close quote. Let's hold a conference, set up a commission, have a lively debate, write editorials, take a stance, position ourselves. These activities, of course, are often referred to as political, at least in the academy, or perhaps at times ethical. We have a responsibility to our ignorance. Given the expansive normativity of communication and given the imperative to make decisions in the face of a contingent but onrushing future, it is not surprising that we live in a time in which the term ethics appears promiscuously in the most surprising couplings business ethics, baseball ethics, bioethics. Although at first blush these pairings would seem to be oxymoronic, Luhmann's conceptual apparatus provides insights into the form these ethical discourses take. It is no surprise that our bureaucratically driven welfare states are permeated with and regulated by procedures. Quote, if we do not know what good reasons are, then we at least want to be able to say how we can test <clears throat> excuse me, whether good reasons are good reasons, and of course, that's only in communication itself. That communication is, of course, about values. Quote, a normative understanding of values serves to allow an ethics to formulate moral demands for the behavior of others, demands that can be ma maintained despite constant disappointments, close quote. This claim means that there are stable reference points established that are impervious to the fact that they are not lived up to. No one can instantiate the value of autonomy. It is a Kantian regulative idea. We have ethical experts whose work is to constantly reassert the importance of autonomy or dignity. Empirical failure in no way deflects or deflates their position. However, such value experts can only explain themselves in value terms. The power relations upon which and through which their positions are constructed, maintained, and expanded fall outside of this discourse. When one group of ethicists ousts another, as happened on the, on the President's Commission, the only language available to explain their victory is one of better ethics. Luhmann points to the philosophy of Hans Jonas as the most sustained attempt to develop an ethics of procedure and value in a technological age. 
Jonas argued that the heart of ethics lies in taking responsibility for the future consequences of one's actions. This position has two major inherent limitations. First, as we live in a modernity in which the future appears as contingent, the ethical actor cannot know the future chain of consequences of his or her actions. This situation leads to a dilemma. Either we do not act, but then who takes responsibility for the consequences of inactions, or we act responsibly, knowing that we cannot know what our actions will stochastically lead to. We find ourselves in the world of being conscious of accepting risk and ethics, at least until now. All we have are procedures and values. Hence, the cost of a responsibility-based ethics may be its impossibility. If we were to be responsible to our ignorance, then we would have to think differently. If we did so, there would be problems translating such structural ignorance and a principled responsibility to it into a kind of technical rationality that our bureaucracies demand. But those problems be would indeed be worth struggling over. Part two, short, nature. George Congenam, French philosopher and historian, in an, in an article entitled Nature Denatured and Naturalizing Nature, provides a stern pedagogical lesson for those who hold sentimental views of nature's purity. Conguilhem observes Western history has seen sporadic waves of protest against the putative, quote, denaturation of human life in both its means and its ends, close quote, putatively caused by techno-economic practices. The common denominator of all such protests is an affect of regret, a deploring of the loss of an imagined, unmediated contact with, quote, that originary absolute essential reference about which we dream under the name of nature. For Conguilhem, such a position is scientifically absurd, although he admits, not without a certain self-satisfaction dear to secular French thinkers, that the position, as well as its associated emotion, could well be theologically coherent. All techniques are artificial. This banality, however, does not imply that techniques are metaphysically distinct from or opposed to nature in any ontological way. For example, if agricultural techniques are to succeed, they must be, quote, rigorously conditioned by the very nature of animal and vegetative, fun vegetable functions of growth and multiplication. This stricture applies to whatever form of technology is at issue, be it that of peasants, industrial agriculturalists, or organic farmers. Quote, for a long time, man has harvested that which he has sown without having made it grow. Close quote. One can intervene in multiple ways with organic things, but the things themselves must have the potential to integrate those changes if the results are to be anything approaching what those applying the technology had sought to bring forth. Certain interventions will do nothing or produce loss. Others will increase yield or produce unexpected results. Technology can be seen as a mode of revealing potentials, not essences. Conguilhem draws two major conclusions from this principle. First, quote, scientifically speaking, denaturation is meaningless. Technically speaking, denaturation means a change in use. No, one, no use is inscribed in the nature of things. The very first use of a thing is its denaturation, close quote. Or, said another, another way, quote, it is certain that one does not denature nature in orienting its powers towards effects that are not the usual ones, close quote. We are only just beginning to learn again how polyvalent and overdetermined organic systems already are. We know very little about their limits. Biotechnological interventions will surely, surely teach us more. Such knowledge, like all knowledge, carries with it risks. Three, risks. Any discussion of risk must confront a definitional question as there are so many different ways to approach the topic. Here I approach the, the, the distinctions again adopted by Luhmann in his book, Risk, a Sociological Analysis. Luhmann asserts that, quote, the world knows no risks, for it knows neither distinctions nor expectations nor evaluations nor probabilities unless self-produced by observer systems in the environment of other systems, close quote. This claim means that any discussion of risk-taking or risk-making entails a reflective state of affairs and a decision about significance. 
Risk has frequently been coupled with security. This coupling is polemically useful but analytically weak. If one opposes something and wants to discredit it, then it is smart to contrast risk with security. By so doing, one implies that there exists a clear choice between a secure state of affairs and one that is not. Of course, the problem is that it is hard to see how anyone could choose the undesirable conditions rather than the desirable ones. If choosing security is a fool's paradise, then another, ways forward, another way forward is to make the primary distinction risk and danger. By so doing, one shifts the focus from a quest for security to an attention to possible future loss. In this mode, one can make a link between a potential loss and a string of decisions that might lead to it. At that point, one is speaking of risk, or as Luhmann says, the risk of decision. Once one begins to operate within the logic of risk and danger, the horizon of safety by no means disappears. Rather, it remains unmarked in the linguistic sense. Within the pair of risk-danger, one can emphasize either side. If one downplays the side of decision-making, then, quote, the possible loss is considered to have been caused externally. That is to say, it is attributed to the environment. In this case, we speak of danger, close quote. Those who mark risk downplay dangers, quote, whereas marking dangers allows the profits to be forgotten that could be earned if risky decisions are made. A reflective observer sees that there can be no risk-free behavior. Deciding to act poses risks of loss in the future, but the observer notes that it's equally true that not acting carries with it its own consequences. Luhmann draws two further consequences relevant here. He calls the first the contingency schema. If one is concerned with the issue of future loss and of decision-making, then we are faced with two temporal contingencies. Event and loss are firmly coupled to as contingencies, not as facts. This makes it possible for observers to differ in the way they see things. Temporal contingencies provoke social contingencies, and this plurality cannot be canceled out by any ontological formula. For Luhmann, accepting contingency means taking up a modern ethos towards the modern world. His second insight rejoins Kongilim, quote, modern risk-oriented society is a product not only of the perception of the consequences of technological achievement, its need is contained in the expansion of research possibilities and of knowledge itself, close quote. The more science we do, the more knowledge we make, the more technological intervention becomes possible, the more choices are posed, the more risk there is, the more imperative to act or not to act imposes itself. And that point must be the beginning of seeing what difference today makes with respect to yesterday. Vigilance and intervention, mem combat, same thing. Part four, last part, problemat problematize. This is a different tack. In 1912, Marcel Duchamp, the painter, left Paris for Munich. In Paris, the art world was battling over Cezanne and Cubism. In Munich, Duchamp encountered a different way of taking up painting, its questions, practices, its history, and its future. Famously, upon his return to Paris, Duchamp called his time in Munich, quote, the occasion of my complete liberation. He abandoned painting as an artisanal pleasure so as to turn it into something else. And obviously, I'm talking about biology here. He did not seek to eliminate painting. Rather, he sought to set up, to, to, he sought to up the, the practice, set up the practice in a new manner, one that was, quote, util utilitarian as opposed to contemplative and ready-made as opposed to artisanal. One might say he abandoned the traditional practices of painting out of loyalty. In a letter he wrote to himself, he was a weird guy, Duchamp said, quote, Marcel, his first name, no more painting. Go get a job. <laughs> the emergence of modernism in painting understood as composed of objects, materials, ways of making things, and forms of subjectivity, can be understood as an ongoing questioning of pictorial practice through successive and overlapping abandonment of each of the traditional modes of taking up these elements. A primary site of the problematization of pictorial practice characteristic of the avant-garde is found in the complex exchanges with industrialization, division of labor, new materials, 
new means of pictorial production and reproduction. Duchamp picked out the paint tube as a paradigmatic locus of such elemental transformations. The first commercially produced tubes of paint appeared during the decade 1830-1840, contemporary with the other specific point of industrialization's penetration into the painter's practice. Like photography, it was thus threatening painters more directly in their artisanal tr traditions. Certainly, the tube of paint freed them from a tedious and me mechanical task, but it also introduced the division of labor into a professional activity that had always sought to maintain as much control as possible over its whole production system. At the time of Duchamp's visit, there existed in Munich a German society for the promotion of rational pictorial procedures. <laughs> Deutsche Gesellschaft, of, never mind, devoted to the preservation of traditional crafts. Industrialization's perceived threat to the status of traditional craft was articulated as the basic reason for this society's existence. The specific threat at issue concerned the control of the manufacture of pigments. This control was passing from the artist to industry, from the studio to the factory. This shift carried with it a number of unexpected challenges and consequences. Artists were losing out to chemists and engineers, sick, for the control of technical knowledge they formerly considered integral to their art. Quote, the workshop recipes that painters since the Van Eck brothers had protected jealousy, jealously from the curiosity of their colleagues and passed on only to their best pupils were now in the public market object of a competition that no longer involved artists on the aesthetic plane, but rather paint manufacturers on the economic plane. Pictorial technique had, had itself been a bearer of tradition, but it was losing its esoteric character and becoming know-how that was part science, part merchandise, and whose success was connected to technological progress and profit. This transformation is fully in line with the more general process of rationalization identified by the great sociologist Max Weber, also living in Munich at the time. The banalization of the tube of paint was, was surely a moment of what Weber called demagification. Demagification is a fundamental principle of modernity. Simply enough, it means that there are no mysterious forces at play in the world that, at least in principle, everything could be known and mastered by calculation. Paint was becoming a controllable material. The efforts of people like Kandinsky and others to spiritualize pure color were, in this perspective, a swan song rather than a prelude. The com commercialization of the tube of paint also brought with it what is taken to be another ineluctable aspect of modernity, standardization. The tube of paint had a price. It had a reliable consistency. It could pass from one place to another while remaining the same. Colors were becoming modern. Industry was now an obligatory site of production for the manufacture and distrib distribution of an artist's primary materials, synthetic biology. What artists did with these primary materials, of course, was not dictated by the materials. Nonetheless, as Duchamp grasped so strongly, the tube of paint was exemplary of the mode in which industrialization contributed to the sp suspension of what had been painting's common sense, as well as its art. That contribution, however, should not be understood as a determining one or a univocal force. The rupture occasioned by 19th century industrialization in the field of artistic practice was a singular historical event, nothing inevitable, it's contingent, which not only survived the conjuncture in which it emerged, but which helped to provide the materials and practices used to retroactively reinterpret what that conjuncture had been. The assimilation of industrial partners and industrial materials into artistic practice was a historical event of extended duration. Rembrandt was engaged in commerce and in the division of labor in his studio. The Impressionists included smokestacks in their painting. Andy Warhol called his studio, quote, the factory. There is no single point that defines the moment of transmogrification of tradition into modernity. However, there certainly have been and there will be moments punctuated by a heightened awareness of change and challenge. Industry did not destroy painting, or crafts for that matter, only made them appear problematic in a new way and for a certain time. Furthermore, industry itself 
is only a general name for a very diverse set of processes, entities, and practices. As Karl Marx underlined, modern industry is characterized, above all, by its relentless change. One certainly can lump together German chemical factories on the eve of the First World War and Genentech at the end of the 20th century, but they can be distinguished with equal plausibility and conviction. It all depends on what you're seeking to elucidate. Conclusion, deduction, Paul Clay. The composer Pierre Boulez, in a beautiful book on the painter Paul Clay, insists that composition and experimentation are inseparable. They are linked, they are linked but not identical. They are joined through motion of stopping and starting, of moving toward, forward and standing back. Boulez observes with admiration that Clay possessed an extraordinary power of deduction. Deduction and distillation is both a sign and a goal of mature art and thinking. The experienced artist knows that creativity is more than creative impulses. He or she knows that this is not just cognitively true, but acts in an embodied mode. Ideas or impulses one discovers, and there is no other way to know them, may well be too rich. That richness can constitute an unexpected encumbrance to creation. Handling this energy may pose unexpected and unsuspected problems. Through practice, at least for certain artists and certain thinkers, the challenge becomes one of how to divide things into smaller units, ones that can be handled better. The painter must be able to derive these units and imagine their development into a larger structure, but equally to have sufficient imagination to maintain their, quote, impulsion to movement. Achieving this motion for Boulez is precisely the essence of composition. Finding the means to do this, the balance of structure and motion, the issue after all of form, varies from practice to practice. Fortunately, there seems to be a large, if indeterminable, number of possibilities within each practice. In his 1912 essay, Approaches to Modern Art, Paul Clay juxtaposes Impressionism and Expressionism. Impressionism, he writes, seeks to, re to receive nature and its existing forms, to let those forms and the sensations of the world press themselves in upon us. The danger and limit of such naturalism, however, is that it privileges observation of form as if they existed by themselves and that the artist's challenge consisted in observing and allowing the capture of that autosufficiency. It is the latter claim that Clay completely disavows. Rather, he maintains that one must approach form and nature in an active mode. Art, but also science, is inseparable from an interventionist relationship to the material. Forms are not merely received, although they are received, and to some degree, they are also, and with equal importance, made. Clay formulated this insight in a 1920 lecture, often cited as his credo, quote, Art does not reproduce the visible, it makes it visible. It is this operational dimension, this rendering, this insistence on activity that is decisive. In 1924, Clay delivered a lecture entitled On Modern Art, where, where he asserted that the artist does not accord to nature the same constraining importance and self-evidence that self-proclaimed realists attribute to it. Quote, fixed forms are not the height of nature's creation. It is nature and process that the artist seeks to make visible, close quote. The artist need not, must not, feel subjected by what exists. That freedom is the artist's right and duty. Furthermore, it is precisely this mode of relating to things that surprisingly provides access to forms. The reason for this unexpected bonus is that nature itself is in constant movement and change. The modern artist attempts to see what is while well, knowing that it could be otherwise, and indeed probably has been otherwise. What has been called Clay's cool romanticism practiced, practiced an extreme attention to things. He practiced the mode of approaching things taken up as if they were already all themselves in the process of transformation. The job of the artist then was not to violate the real any more than he needed to adopt an avant-garde opposition to it. Rather, as, nat as things themselves were in a process of transformation, it was perfectly consistent to find their motion there where it lay and to work with it. 
In his famous Bauhaus lessons, Paul Klee again provides a highly distilled exposition and demonstration of the means for achieving motion in painting. Through his teaching and interchanges with his colleagues and students, he moved towards a kind of purification, one that led back to geometry and its abstractions. Working systematically on elaborating the multiple uses of the simplest elements, the square, the circle, the straight line, Clay laid out the logical variations, combinations, connections, and mutual reciprocities. Clay's geometry, however, was not Euclidean. Clay, Boulez writes, preserved une zone d'insoumission, a zone of freedom. Clay's dissidence allowed him even greater access to a nature and hence to a new art and a new science. Thank you. Yeah. What, I, what I'd like to do is um, suggest that if anybody wants to um, um, bring up points with Paul directly, that we'll spend a couple minutes doing that now. Um, there's obviously a, a, a very serious call for action related to uh, the other points that were discussed earlier. Um, I will do my best to organize that. Um, and to the extent you'd like to be involved with that, contact me or any of the other folks so that we can begin to work forward. Um, we'll carry through the rest of the conversations going into the poster sessions, which I hope that we can defer for just a couple minutes so that Paul has a chance to respond or if any of the other panelists would like to make a point. Thanks. Where I totally agree with George is, again, this Max Weber science as a vocation. The scientific community had better start defending itself to itself and to others in a fashion that's um, actually more serious than it has done in, of late. And that living in a society that's as technologically oriented and as profoundly anti-intellectual as the United States is, I think that many scientists have been um, a little too self-congratulatory in thinking that the kind of regimes that the rest of us who are attempting to think are subjected to, and this includes both the right and the left, uh, you're going to escape from. But I assure you, you're not. 